Good morning, church family. It is a privilege and a delight to be with you all today. Today, we are going to be picking up our journey through the New Testament book of 1 John. We're gonna be reading the last sentence of chapter three, and we're gonna be going into the first paragraph of 1 John chapter four. The Apostle John writes, beginning in the last half of verse 24 of chapter three, and by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. This is God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through the gift of your word. And I thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that has inspired these very words to be written. Lord, wherever there is darkness, would your spirit shine light in our hearts? Wherever there is error, would you bring us into the truth? Teach us to have ears that recognize what your spirit is saying to us, and may your Holy Spirit lead us into an ever-growing vision of glory of Christ, your Son, and our Lord. So, Lord, it's in light of these things that I ask that these words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. It's in Christ's name that we pray, amen. Amen, you can have your seat today. Now imagine for a moment that you are Pharaoh, that you're the high king of ancient Egypt. You are the most powerful person you've ever known, the most powerful person you've ever met, You have more wealth than anybody you've ever known. Not only do the people of your nation follow you, they effectively worship you as if you are a God living on earth. And then one day, as you're sitting on your throne, as your royal court is in session, this shepherd and his brother, a man named Moses and Aaron, walk before you and they they come before you. Now, you can recognize by what these men are wearing that they are belonging to the race of Hebrew slaves, people that have been subjected by your people, by your kingdom, and they exist essentially just to serve you. But these shepherds come before you, and they should be cowering. They should be absolutely terrified and afraid of your might and your majesty, but instead, something crazy happens. They say that they've been sent by God. This man named Moses actually tells you that his God commanded you to let all of your slaves go. It's such an absurd command. It's such an absurd happening that it would almost be funny if it weren't so brazenly offensive to come in to speak to such a man in such a way. And so you command that this Moses must prove that his God has such authority to make such a request, such a demand of you. There's no way that this can happen. You think that you're calling this shepherd on his bluff, but then he does something that is truly shocking. He tells his brother Aaron to throw his staff on the ground and immediately that staff transforms supernaturally into a writhing snake. Suddenly this serpent has appeared out of nowhere and everybody's astonished, but not to worry, you're the Pharaoh of Egypt. You have magicians who actually work in your royal court and so you command them to come forth and they too throw down their staffs and again, shockingly, these staffs turn into serpents. It's an odd moment. You might be tempted to celebrate if you're the Pharaoh, but then something weird happens. The first snake eats the other snakes, but you're not gonna pay attention to that. The trick has already been performed. The deed has been done. 
you've shown that you have supernatural power as well. And so the Egyptian magicians begin to speak and they're like, don't listen to this shepherd. Don't listen to this man named Moses. Moses, true, he had, seems to have some type of supernatural, spiritual power, but we have power too. We have access to the supernatural as well. And so if you're the Pharaoh, how would you know who to listen to? How would you know whose words to trust? How would you know how to discern what is true? This little contest of spiritual power is admittedly very strange, but it's also very real. It happens in the Old Testament book of Exodus. You can look it up in Exodus chapter seven if you're interested. But it illustrates this key concept that we encounter throughout the Bible and especially in the text that we just read today. And that key concept is this. Just because something seems spiritual does not mean that it is from the Spirit of God. Just because something seems supernatural does not mean that it is from God. Because from the days of Moses, thousands of years ago, to the days of the apostles, all the way to the current moment in history, there have been many people who seem to be connected to something that is spiritual. There are these leaders and gurus who seem to be connected to some type of supernatural power. And many times such individuals will claim to speak with divine authority. They might even claim to speak on behalf of God himself. The question is, how do we know who to trust? So how can you tell if this televangelist on cable television is truly teaching the word of God or if he is simply a swindler who preys on the gullible to grow his own fortune and fame? How can you tell if the person that you're listening to on YouTube or on TikTok actually knows what they're talking about or if they're simply spouting nonsense with such unbelievable confidence that people believe them? Maybe a more pertinent question would be, how do you know you should trust anything that I have to say today or any other Sunday for that matter? It's with these questions in mind that I wanna now explore the crucial topic of spiritual discernment. This word discernment essentially it refers to the ability to tell the difference between what is true and what is false. Discernment is the ability to tell what is real from what is fake. It is the ability to see beneath the surface and beyond illusions to see what is genuine and true. And as we dig into this passage, I wanna examine four major ideas about spiritual discernment. Number one, we're gonna explore the need for spiritual discernment. Number two, the test of spiritual discernment. Number three, the power behind spiritual discernment. And finally, number four, the standard of spiritual discernment. So point number one, the need for spiritual discernment. The book of 1 John is written by the Apostle John. He is the last of the living apostles of Jesus. He's now writing as an elderly man in his later years of life, writing this book that we now call 1 John as a word of pastoral encouragement and warning to the next generation of Christians that are coming up behind him. As John nears his own death, he knows that it is now the job of this next generation of Christians to bear witness to the way of Jesus, even in a world that is oftentimes very confusing and a world that is oftentimes very hostile to their faith. And it's evident that John truly loves the people to whom he writes. That's why over and over again throughout this letter, he will refer to his readers as his children, even as his beloved. He knows that there will be false teachers and leaders who will seek to lead those that he loves astray. And so it's from a place of sincere pastoral love that he will write these words in verse one. He will say, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, this is not just a suggestion, this is a command. This is an imperative statement. He's saying something that might be a command that comes across a little bit absurd, a little bit strange in our own cultural context because after all, we live in a culture that has been conditioned to see the world around us as nothing more than matter in motion. Many in our culture have essentially lost the ability to sense the spiritual, to be able to acknowledge the supernatural, to 
to have a hunger for that which is transcendent. We might ask the question, why should we care about testing the spirits and spirituality in an enlightened scientific age such as our own? You see, for the Apostle John, the issue is not whether or not spirituality is real. For John, and indeed for most people around this globe and most humans throughout all of history, it is simply a given that there is a spiritual aspect to our lived human experience. Deep in our bones, we already know that our universe is more than what we can observe and record. We know that reality is so much more than just matter and motion. And in this way, spirituality is this undeniable part of the human experience. But John wants us to know that just because something is spiritual does not mean that it is true. Just because something is spiritual does not mean that it is good or that it is of God. Not everything that is spiritual comes from the Holy Spirit. And that's why the apostle warns, many false prophets have gone out into the world. Notice this is not a hypothetical scenario. The existence of false prophets is something that's a, a declarative statement about reality. There will be false teachers. There will be false prophets. There will be those who teach and preach the word of God intentionally or unintentionally in a way that would lead other people into a place of spiritual deception. This happened in the time of the New Testament era, and this also happens today. The Christians are not to be a people who are spiritually gullible. Christians are called and commanded to be a people of spiritual discernment. And that begins by simply with a humble acknowledgement that we have the capacity to be led astray. That we must not be wise in our own eyes. That we must humble ourselves and acknowledge that there's something within us that if it's, if it's not put in check, can be deceived by the powers and principalities of this world, by the the distortions and the stories of this world to lead us away from Christ. But we might ask, okay, if we need to be on the lookout for false prophets, what should we be looking for? Should we be expecting them to carry a name tag that says, hi, my name is Satanist priest? Probably not, right? Should we expect them to wear you know, dark wizard robes and go around with titles like Lord Voldemort? Again, probably not. If that were the case, we wouldn't need to discern false prophets. We would only have to acknowledge them. No, actual false prophets are subtle, not sensational. They oftentimes deal in the realm of covert deception, not overt demonic display. Hauntingly, they are counterfeits. Counterfeits that look very much like the real thing, and that is exactly why they are so effective. Because you see, the most dangerous lie is the one that most closely approximates the truth. And so a false prophet is anyone or anything that plausibly would claim to speak with ultimate authority, but in reality is speaking something that is in contrary contradiction to the authoritative truth of God. A false prophet is anyone or anything that tries to convince you that really it's your savior, not Jesus. And that certainly will include the swindler televangelist, but I want you to know that false prophecy goes far beyond the realm of Christendom. In other words, it's something that appeals not just to Christians, but people of all stripes of faith or lack thereof. Both the religious and the irreligious can be just as vulnerable to the deception of false prophets of this world. So yes, a false prophet might be a religious teacher who teaches some type of a distorted doctrine, but it could also be something else. It could be anything or anyone that's trying to step into the place that only Christ should be in your life. A false prophet is anything or anyone that says to your heart, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I am the way to your self-worth, I am the source of your validation, I am the one that will make you feel accepted before God and man. Come and follow me. So it might be as simple as a false prophet is, maybe it's even like a diet that says, if you follow me, I will be the one that restores you. If, if I can occupy your imagination and all the concern of your life, I will give you the acceptance and the value and the control that you so crave. It might be a five-year plan or investment strategy that says, if you give me your allegiance, if you give me your hope, if you follow me, I will make you feel safe. I will make you feel secure. False prophets can even be a political party. 
political candidate that says, if you follow me, if you place your hope in me, I will defeat your enemies. I will right all that is wrong. I will make all things new. And with that definition in mind, you can kind of see an expanded notion of how many false prophets really might be in this world. All people, Christian and non-Christians alike, whether they know it or not, are seeking some type of salvation. And false prophets essentially appeal to that natural, innate hunger for salvation, and then they proclaim to our heart a salvation that is other than Christ. So we have to be discerning. How can we tell the difference? How can we tell the difference between false prophets and, and true teaching? How can we tell prophets no? Well, that brings us to the next point, the test of spiritual discernment. In the world of chemistry, one of the most basic tests that you can perform on a given substance is called a litmus test. A litmus test is a very easy, a very inexpensive way to determine essentially the pH value of a given substance, whether a substance is an acid or a base or it's something neutral. And so a litmus test is important because it can tell you if this clear glass of liquid in front of you is neutral like water or if it's a corrosive acid that's deadly and dangerous. We need litmus tests in chemistry, but we also need litmus tests when it comes to spirituality. And John is going to give us perhaps the most helpful litmus test we could ever have in the realm of spirituality in this very passage. He writes in verses two and three, by this you will know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. People of God, true Christian spirituality, true Christian faith and practice are all about Jesus. Christianity is founded on Jesus, centered on Jesus, and perpetually, immersively dependent on Jesus. And according to John, the defining trait of a false spirituality is that it denies Jesus. It distorts Jesus or it diminishes Jesus in some way. A false spirituality is essentially any worldview or story that we tell ourselves that places Jesus not at the very center. He's either out of the picture altogether or he's only on the margins, only on the sidelines. Now, at the time that John is writing this particular letter, there is a heresy that is seeking to infiltrate the Christian communities. And the core of this false doctrine was effectively a denial that Christ had come in the flesh, that Jesus, in other words, was not totally human. And the name of this teaching was called docetism. Docetism essentially taught that all matter anything that existed in material reality was intrinsically evil. And so Jesus couldn't have been a human. He could not have been a real person because that meant that he would have had to become material. And so the, the docetists essentially taught that Jesus was a pure spirit that only gave the mirage that he was totally human. And this was essentially dangerous because without both the full humanity and the full divinity of Jesus Christ, we don't have a gospel. If Jesus Christ wasn't completely human, that means that he could not have died the death that he died on the cross in our place. If Jesus wasn't completely human, he could not have risen from the grave. Without Jesus' full humanity, we don't have hope for salvation. And so John is opposing this with the utmost fierceness. He, he is saying, we cannot afford to believe such things or listen to anyone who would want us to believe such things. Now, the early church dealt with a lot of heresies, not just docetism, but it is crucial if you study church history to understand that almost every single major heresy, every single major doctrine that was a true threat to the church always sought to somehow distort the doctrine of Jesus Christ. It always sought to distort how we understood Jesus Christ. And here's the big idea. Spiritual deception always attacks the doctrine of Jesus because if we lose Jesus, we lose everything. This is why even now, false doctrine usually denies Jesus, distorts Jesus, or distracts us from the absolute centrality of Jesus. You see this in popular films and books like The Da Vinci Code. 
You might even hear it every now and then you flip through channels and you see a crackpot scholar on the History Channel saying, well, maybe Jesus was just really an alien. All of those are still just attempts to distract us and distort our vision of Christ. But it can happen in more insidious ways, even inside of the church. For example, in modern day America, there are many spiritual teachers who are take our cultural idolatry of prosperity and call it the Christian gospel. They'll say, if you give lots of money to my ministry, or if you give lots of money to the church where I lead, Jesus will then be obligated to give you a lot of money. He will give you perfect help. He will eliminate your suffering, and you will live a blessed life. This form of teaching is oftentimes called the prosperity gospel. And there have been many preachers in America, and now even outside of America, that will teach some version of the prosperity gospel, and they've been able to gain quite a bit of popularity and quite a bit of profit by doing this. But I want you to know the prosperity gospel is no gospel. It's a demonic distortion of Jesus Christ. And the reason it is, is because it reduces Jesus, who should be the absolute object of our affection and worship and glory, and it reduces him to a stepping stone. It makes him a utility that we step on to get to the idol that we really worship. An idol as simple as money, health, prosperity, power. And the danger of the prosperity gospel is that it absolutely crushes people when they are living as they think they should live, but they endure suffering. Whenever they rub up against a sin-fractured world and it wounds them deeply. But you see, there's actually many doctrines in this world that are in opposition to Jesus Christ, not just the prosperity gospel. But many spiritual powers will harness these ideologies or false doctrines, and they will simply lure our heart to be more and more distracted from the hope that we have in Jesus. There's actually a reason that outside, when you drive by Sonsi, we have a church street sign that says for 12 years, it's all about Jesus. It's not just because we're really lazy and we ran out of ideas. It's because we really do perpetually wanna be a church that is all about Jesus. We put that before our eyes and we put that before our city because we want to be a church that is purposefully all about Jesus because it's really easy in the sin-fractured world to be distracted, to be pushed one way or another way, to make Jesus not quite the center anymore, to allow our our allegiance to be with Jesus to be displaced with something else. And that's important for us to be able to recognize as a people, we need to be all about Jesus because it's easy to become a church that's all about celebrity personality, all about corporate growth, all about culture war. But beyond that, this challenge to be decentered from Jesus is not just something that's a corporate reality. It's not just something that churches can struggle with. It's even something that we can struggle with on a personal level. Think about how many voices there are in this world to try to arrest your attention and your allegiance. Think about how many seemingly neutral things about your daily life might cause your commitment or your faithfulness to Jesus to be just a little bit compromised. Things like your career, your hobbies, your kids' sports league, your social media habits, the news that you consume and what occupies your imagination. And concerning these things that can cause us to deny, distort, or be distracted from Jesus, John has some shocking things to say. He says, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. See, the Antichrist isn't just some incarnated version of the devil that will wage war against God at the very end of time. The spirit of the Antichrist is anything that would cause you to deny Christ, to believe something distorted about Christ, or to simply be distracted from Christ. And so I want you to actually ask yourself, what does this look like for you? We would do well to ask ourselves the questions, what are the antichrists of our own culture? What are the antichrists around me that I would be most susceptible to be led astray by? What are the forces at play in my life, in my world, that would distract me from church and worship? 
that would distract me from participating in Christian community, that would distract me from truly reading God's word or praying to God on a daily basis? What are the habits or forces that lead you to a place of further and further isolation, autonomy, and trusting in your own wisdom or trusting in the wisdom of this culture rather than that of God? There are spiritual forces that would seek to pull our hearts away from God, but I want you to know this. We should not despair. Yes, when you go out into the world next week, when you leave this building and go out into the world today, there will be forces that press upon you. But God has also given us a power that is far greater than any power that would seek to lead us astray. And that leads us to our third point. And that is the power behind spiritual discernment. When we see how vital we need discernment, when how easy it is for us to even be led astray or deceived, it would be really easy to become discouraged or cynical, but John won't let us do that. Instead, he's going to give us a profound reason to rejoice with confidence. Look at verse four. He says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. John is reminding us of a critical truth. He's saying, if you are a Christian, if you have placed your trust in Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is who he said he was, that he died for you, that he rose again for you, that he is God and Lord, you already have the power within you to win the war of discernment. Why? Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Who is within you? It's the very Holy Spirit of God, the one who abides with us and within us. That is an astonishing truth, people of God. That when you believe in Jesus, it's not just that you become a fan of a new religious ideology. It's not just that you become even a member of an institution like a church. When you become a Christian, God sent his very spirit to live within you, to allow you to participate in his life. The very spirit that rose Jesus from the grave, the very spirit that was a part of authoring existence into being lives within you, dwells within you, and he will commune with you. He will be the one who within you is able to recognize what is true and what is false. He will say, yes, this is true, and no, this is false. He is the one who will bring you back over and over again to the absolute centrality of Jesus. He is the one who can recognize and discern truth because he is the spirit of truth. Now, it's also true that many people in this world are going to, by nature, reactively reject the truth. There are many who will find the truth of God not only to be false, but also abhorrent. They will find it repellent. And such people will not only fail to reject the words of false prophets, they'll actually desire them. They'll actually wanna hear what the false prophets have to say. So John reminds us, they are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. The Apostle Paul says a similar idea in the book of 1 Corinthians. He says, and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Simply said, when the good shepherd speaks, his sheep will hear his voice. If you're a Christian, you have the capacity, the ability to hear God speak. But what many others will hear when they hear the truth of God or what God would speak to his people, they'll just hear nonsense. And the big idea is this, is without the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit, we are by nature dead to spiritual truth. And because of this, will be many people in our world that despise the truth of God and the truth of scripture. And we need to expect this to be the case. Spiritual truth, in other words, will oftentimes appear offensive to the world around us. And so we need to know this as the people of God. If we're gonna be followers of Jesus, if we're gonna faithfully bear witness to Jesus, there will be moments and there will be times that the spirit of God is in direct opposition to the spirit of this age. They will collide. And if you are a Christian, you are called to not only discern what is true, you are called to live in the truth and for the truth, even when it's not culturally convenient or popular. There will be times when faithfulness to Jesus puts us at odds with the world that is around us. But while the truth of this world changes like the shifting sands of time, the truth of the gospel will endure into eternity. 
And that'll lead us to our final point today, the standard of spiritual discernment. Final thing I wanna show you comes from the last verse of this passage. John writes, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever not, is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth, the spirit of error. Now, the question is, is who is the we? John is saying, we know that we're from God. Is he talking about all Christians? Is he talking about just himself? Well, when we see this command to acknowledge the spiritual authority of what's being said, we need to look at the greater context of the book of 1 John. As we remember, when we go back to the very first chapter, John is talking about his ministry as an apostle. This is not just a random Christian who is speaking or writing a letter. This is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is one who has been an eyewitness to Jesus. He has seen Jesus. He has heard the voice of Christ. He's a witness to his death. He's a witness to his resurrection. And even more than that, he has been personally commissioned and empowered and given authority by Jesus to go bear forth this testimony to the nations. In other words, when John is writing these words, he's saying this is not just a normal letter. This comes with authority. Now, Here's the sad truth. All the apostles are gone now, right? We live in an age where the original apostles of Jesus, they are no longer with us. So what's then going to be our standard of truth? What's gonna be the ultimate arbiter of truth? Well, we do have the testimony of the apostles and it's right here. We have the words of scripture. We have the New Testament, which is the testimony of the apostles themselves. And this is important. Because it shows us that Holy Scripture is the final standard for spiritual discernment. You can discern what the Holy Spirit is saying because, number one, he will always point you to Jesus. Number two, he will abide within your heart because you are a Christian who has placed your hope in Jesus. But lastly, you can always recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit because he will always agree with the words of Scripture that he inspired to be written. You wanna know what the voice of the Holy Spirit truly sounds like. His voice is still and small. It is the kindest voice you will ever hear. It is the gentlest voice you will ever hear. Yet it is the most powerful voice you will ever hear. And it will always sound exactly like this. It will sound like the very words that he has written. False prophets have come and gone throughout the whole of world history. In fact, in Jesus' day, there were even those that claimed to be the Messiah, those who said that they had the capacity to defeat the enemies of God, that they would build up God's temple, that they would establish God's kingdom on earth. However, none but Jesus was the real Messiah, and we know that. You see, the empire of Rome, they had this neat little tendency to put all would-be Messiahs to death. They even put Jesus to death. But none but Jesus rose from the grave. No other Messiah but Jesus conquered the power of death by the power of his resurrection. No other Messiah but Jesus has ascended to the throne of heaven. No other Messiah but Jesus has commissioned his people with the very power of his spirit to go forth and declare the good news of his kingdom that is coming. No other Messiah but Jesus is coming back to make all things new. So yes, there are false prophets false teachers, antichrists in this world today, they will compete for your affection. They'll compete for your allegiance. They will try to form your vision for life. They will call upon you and they will tell you that they can save you, but only Jesus has loved you so much that he has died for you. Only Jesus defeated death for you. Only Jesus offers you true life. And only Jesus will give you the gift of his very spirit. People of God, Jesus is better. Believe in him, trust in him, receive him today. So people of God, may we be a people of discernment who understand what is true and what is false. In our spiritual journeys, may we learn to forsake anything or anyone that would seek to deceive us or distract us from Jesus. And instead, may we be a people who are dependent upon the Holy Spirit and forever centered upon Jesus Christ, amen? Amen, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for your truth, for your words of warning, and for your encouragement. It's important that 
we know that there are false teachers. It's important that we know that there are forces that would seek to lead us astray. But it's also so crucial, so important to know that you have poured out your spirit upon us. That you've not left us as orphans. You have not abandoned us. You have given us your very spirit that we might know you and recognize you and follow you. And so I pray that today you would open our ears that we might hear what your spirit is speaking to us. Lord, I pray that throughout the rest of the service as we worship you, as we praise you, as we pray to you, that you would perhaps illuminate our hearts to anything that has been leading us astray from you. If there's something in our life that's distracting us from you, something that's diminishing the glory of Christ in our lives, Lord, would you show us what that is so that we could lay it aside? Lord, and especially for those that today, maybe they're this place and they, they have not yet put their trust in you. I pray that today would be the day that they would trust you, that they would follow you, and that today you would pour their spirit upon your heart, upon their hearts. So Lord, we confess we need you, but we rejoice that you've given us everything that we need in Christ and through your spirit. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray these things, amen.